let's go through the uh, subcontractor seminar. You know the theme of our subcontractor seminar is just doing right at the first time. Process control is the key. So there are certain aspects which are really required to be looked at. And one of the key aspects is the material control. I believe most of the people will be knowing why we really require materials. So let's throw the classification of the properties of the steel, why we need to do the material identification, why we need to do a testing on materials, how a material has to be handled and to be stored, and the importance of material identification, and finally, the material traceability. I'm for sure that people are aware that the classification of materials are forest and non-forest, and there are a lot of standards which talks about the classification of materials. As we know, in Triadoc World Dubai, we mostly work on normal strength steel, and a high strength steel. Most of the most of the ship repair, we just handle this grade A BD materials, and for high strength, we use EH36, AH32 materials. And for conversions and for new building projects, we use this high strength steel, which is A420, E620, and so forth. The tensile values and yield values are a bit more comparing to the normal and high strength steel. Why exactly is the material identification is required? It starts from the plate. Once it has been rolled down, we can see that the materials have been marked with the heat numbers. So each material should have a proper heat number traced on the plate. So material marking provides a system of identification of material from the state of rolling to the fabrication and to the end product of it. So from there, we need to really track it out the heat number, which gives a proper traceability. And what exactly we can see on the plate is the specifications, where the third parties gives it us, and they will just approve it, grade A or whatever will be the material. We can see the specification of it, the dimension of the material, the heat number of it, and the plate number. If it is rolled from one single plate, you can get the plate number of it. So it's, if you can see over there, you can see ABS, LR, GNBs, and so forth. This, this place shows that these have been approved by this, those third parties. So this is one typical example of how plates have been identified. So proper traceability has been secured. And how these are traced out? These are traced through the mill certificate, which I'll be explaining in the next stage, uh, where this is a typical mill certificate which we receive during each material we receive into Dry Docks World Dubai. So it is very important for you people to, whenever you receive material from Dry Rocks, ensure that you get a mill certificate with it. And I'll just explain to you why we really need this mill certificate in my next slide. The mill certificate will give you the proper information of the exact plate what you're going to use it down. If you see on the right side over there, the heat number and the dimension of the plate has been very clearly mentioned. You got a certificate number over there, and most important details is whether this has been approved by so many third parties and whether the material has been normal steel or a rolled steel, whatever be there. So all those informations are very clearly mentioned in the smell certificate. And very important to note is the remark where you get certain informations from the mill certificate. If you can see over there, you can see the dimensional tolerance, surface conditions, and a lot of activities. And to finalize it out, we can see the third party signatures of all the, you can see Americans Bureau of Shipping, Lloyds, DNB. So all these companies have just approved this plate. So these informations are very clear in mill certificate. So points to be looked at in material identification is identify the material to be used. You need to ensure that these informations, you have to get it from the drawing. So it is very important that we look into the drawing what exactly the material we need to be used for, for the fabrication of our unit. So please ensure that, check the drawing, what materials you exactly need it, try to get that material off. Identify the material with the plate marking and record it. It is very important that whatever material you receive from dry docks or anywhere else, ensure that it's been marked properly, the full traceability is be there. And correlate the material with the mill certificate to ensure that 
whatever heat number is there on the plate is, is what you got it with the mill certificate. And finally, full traceability has to be fully covered with this. I'll just show you. There are certain aspects where there won't be a traceability of the material. In that case, we really need to go for testing. So for testing, we need to confirm that whatever properties, we have to ensure that we have to make, a, make sure that it has been according to the requirement. If there is a missing of traceability, or if there is unable to track the heat number, which is very important, in that case, we do the testing to ensure that, okay, we, we get information out of it. Material upgradation. Sometimes, in some projects, we won't be able to, if the material is ES32, we may need to go for ES36, then we go for material upgradation. To ensure ourselves that we need to go for an upgradation of it, we, we ensure with our third party that we'll do a material testing of it, and I'll explain to you what and all testing we're going to do to ensure that it, that material can be used up for the next layer. And failure analysis, if you can see over there, if a material tends to fail, why the reason is exactly failing. So we can just test it through the material certificate testing. So <clears throat> material testing is to analyze the characteristic of the metal. So we have different kinds of testing, but we are going to talk only about the mechanical testing in that we are going to talk about tensile and impact testing. Tensile testing is to measure the resistance of a material when a slowly or a static applied force. You must have seen this UMC machine. I uh, believe if you just keep the test specimen in between, and there are certain important requirements for a test specimen to be. The test specimen is taken from the rolling direction of the plate, either it can be transverse or a longitudinal test specimen. Longitudinal will be taken parallel to the rolling direction, and transfer test will be taken perpendicular to the rolling direction. And a typical test piece should be like this, with the dimensions on it. You should have a reduced diameter section of 230 mm in that you should mark it a gauge length over there of 200 mm, and you should have a radius of 25 mm, and 75 mm is for holding the bag. And very important is the gauge length, and I will explain you why. When you do the proper gauge marking over there, when you do the testing, once, the, once it gets elongated, you can see a break in the structure. So we just calculate the change in length by the original length gives the percentage of elongation. So that's, that's, that's how we identify that, how much the material can handle. So this is a typical tensile testing. Another one is our impact testing. How do we do impact testing? The reason for doing impact testing is to identify the amount of energy the material can absorb during fracture. And I believe these are the typical. Um, there is one particular requirement for this impact testing is the notch. Why exactly we do need a We need a notch over there. The notch gives the stress concentration zone over there. So whenever there are certain materials over here which which are very sensitive to the notches. So that's why most of the offshore industries, they require smooth grinding. They, just, they don't require any undercuts, no, um, um, what do you call? They, don't, uh, they want a smooth grinding at all the locations. That's the reason we, we make sure that we don't allow this notch formation. So the notch, has, notch should be around 2 mm depth with a radius of 0.25 mm. And when it cracks, you can see how it feels. And we do the lamination checking. Lamination checking is just to see if there is any uh, linear discontinuity or a planar discontinuity in between the plate. So this, has be, this we just carry out randomly to identify if there is any planar discontinuity on the plate. OK, the most important aspect of, uh, of our subcontractor is the storage and handling of the material. If the material is not been maintained properly, then it, the, the, the product which you are going to receive at the end stage, we won't be, we are not, we definitely it won't be to, suiting to the requirement. So the best thing is that if, if, the, if the storage is not properly, the contaminations can lead to pitting. And you can see that the scales formation on the top of the plate 
You can have cross-contamination if it is a stainless steel mixed with a carbon steel. If there, the material will be damaged, which I can just show you in the picture slides, and it will be a delay in retrieval of the material, which is also quite complicated, and poor inventory control. This is a typical good example for uh, pipe handling, where you can see the pipes have been properly segregated with both hands capped up, which is very, very vital. If the caps are not there, there is a possibility of contamination inside the pipe. And a typical example for plate handling. If the, prop, the plates have been segregated properly, then it is very easy for us to retrieve it. At the same time, it is easy to identify with the heat number and the track number. And these are some examples for contaminations which we identified on the plate and some damages because of handling. You can see over there on the slide in the center, we can see a stainless steel pipe got corroded up because of some carbon steel mixed with it. And some, because of improper handling, we can see a final product. We have some scratches here and there. And some finest examples for, uh, for handling of the place where you can see the planes have some bends and dents. Because of this, we won't be able to use these kinds of plates. So I would appreciate we, we ensure that the plates are properly handled up. And the most important aspect of it is the material identification. Why we really need to do an identification of the material. The material identification starts from drawing, then from there it goes to the material preparation. Once the material is being prepared, it goes to the fabrication stage. Once it is fabricated, then it has been inspected. Then once it is inspected, when it's filled, then it goes for the documentation, which is the final. So this is a typical example of how a drawing will be, where you can see, this is one of our offshore project drawing, where you can see all the informations which are related to materials have been there over there. You can see some dimensions, or what and all, well, well plating tapers and so forth. But I'm very much interested on looking at the materials, which is sixth of it, which says that all plating sections to be Lloyd's grade ES3016, that means we, can, we have a lot of ES36 material, but they are very much particular in Lloyd's grade ES36 steel. So we have to ensure that proper drawing reading should, is important. Once, once we ensure that we got, the right, uh, we got the right drawing and we have analyzed what exactly the material we need to use, then it comes to material preparation. Material preparation is like how you identify the material and how you get it from the purchase then you need to correlate from the purchase department the materials, whatever you received, is according to the mill certificate. And we have to do a facial check on the plate to ensure that there is no uh, visual damages. And then whenever you're just taking an off-cut of material, you just ensure that a proper identification on the off-cuts is there. And transfer all the heat numbers to all the off-cuts. This can ensure that we have a full traceability of the material. When it comes to the fabrication, Plate cutting is a vital role, so we ensure that a proper identifi identification is there, then it is easy to mark, even if it is a small off cuts, it is easy to track it down. So proper marking and cutting reduces the wastage of material. So please ensure yourself that whenever, whatever be the piece, if it is a half cut or if it is a full plate, ensure that the proper marking has been made. Even on the off cut material with proper traceability can be it can be reused. You, can, you don't need to put it on the scrap. Okay, so concluding to this, each piece fabricated shall be matched with the mill certificate, which is very important in material control. And heat number shall be transferred onto the cutting plan and off cut, so that the full traceability is maintained. And marking, either if it is not possible to do it by plasma cutting, we can even punch it. So that gives us that all the heat numbers are transferred to the each plate. This gives a full traceability registers and we can maintain and we can make our customer happy on it. I believe this is a short, simple way of saying it. Know what exactly we need to do. Commit yourself to it and practice it. Thank you very much. We've talked a lot about quality and uh, it is the, the keynote uh, uh, presentations are also all about quality. Uh, I will talk about the other aspect, which is safety, and what you also mentioned about 
quality having to conform to a certain specification or standard. And in this case, the standard or specification is either, say, classification rules or the other aspect of it, regulatory requirements, which, uh, uh, which governments uh, put into force. So we are looking at the historical development of these of the regulatory regime, maritime regulatory regime. Also, uh, this is something that uh, this is something that is a balance. Like Mr. Seigel this morning, he was talking about uh, how you have to put quality in the background or in the backdrop of an economic downturn and provide a balance. I mean, quality is not something absolute that you achieve. It's always relative. And you have to look at other aspects like profitability and uh, survivability, you know, viability. So uh, safety, again, is a similar thing. It's always a balance. There is nothing like providing absolute safety because safety costs. Safety costs money, and nobody has got unlimited amount of it. So when you make a design, you always try to find that balance. So. Just a, a slide on shipping. I, I don't need to explain to this uh, uh, audience the importance of shipping. Uh, but just to give you some of the figures that are involved over here, uh, you're looking at 6 billion tons of cargo being moved across the globe. Um, and I think uh, this, is, this figure is probably, uh, was probably more last year. Um, and one third of that is oil, 2 billion tons and uh, more of oil later, because oil, as we see, is, uh, has been a cause of a lot of, um, lot of things in the media. When we look at accidents, uh, actually, it's not that accidents haven't happened in the past. Uh, it's just that um, we are not only transporting more and more across the globe every year because of rise in population, rise in global trade, and uh, and the economy is becoming more affluent as, as time goes by. So with this volume, the number of accidents might really have increased. But if you look at percentage-wise, possibly it has reduced. So again, uh, some figures uh, to do with uh, how much is actually carried. Uh, fleet of ships, some 850 million tons of dead weight. We've had uh, more than 5,600 bulk carriers of more than 10,000 tons dead weight, the world's fleet. And we're looking at the lost figures in 2003. Uh, only four were lost, and none of them due to structural failure. And uh, five were lost in 2004. One was from structural fa uh, failure. And as a percentage, again, it's, it's very little, as you, as you can see. But, uh, Ultimately, again, these are figures, statistics, like they say, they, 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 uh, they hide more than they reveal. Finally, you're talking about people. I mean, there are seafarers out there, so even a loss of one ship, uh, it means a lot. So uh, one can't go completely by statistics alone. Yeah? To look at the other aspect of maritime uh, disasters, uh, oil spills. 20 years ago, there were more than 25 major spills of more than 700 tons per year. And that has been reduced to less than four spills. We are definitely doing well. Since 1980, losses from all causes of self-propelled seagoing merchant ships of 500 gross tons and more declined from high of three vessels per thousand to current of one vessel per thousand. So again, two-thirds reduction in loss rate. So statistics-wise, we, we are definitely doing well. The industry uh, has improved its safety record. But as you know, um, the, the industry today is almost an over-regulated industry. There are so many regulations coming out every day. Uh, it's like people working overtime to make more and more regulations. We find that they, I think the industry is finding it difficult to keep up with it all. You know. If you, if you look back in history, I mean, up to the year maybe 1970 or so, uh, we used to hardly have, I mean, we had, okay, Marpol, we had Solas, or Marp, and, and uh, that was it, really. We didn't have the 
multiplicity of certificates that you see today, the conventions which are coming up. Part of it is, of course, because of, you know, we are moving towards a cleaner and greener environment and people are looking more and more to save, to save the environment and preserve it for future generations to come. So, and um, as I said uh, earlier, it's not that we have more accidents now, but whatever little accidents happen is really blown out by the media. People are much more aware. People are watching the television everywhere across the globe. And when you have an oil spill and you find a few, um, even if it is insignificant, the, the media really pans it out and puts a lot of pressure on the shipping industry. The governments feel that pressure because ultimately you're talking about human lives, environment, and uh, they feel forced to do something about it, you know. Okay, have a committee look into it, make a new regulation, when actually probably all it needed was to comply with whatever is existing. This is uh, one of the most famous uh, ones. I mean, you have probably all seen the movie, and uh, there is a Titanic society, and there is memorabilia, there are people, descendants of uh, people who uh, died in the Titanic. It's, uh, I'll, I will look at some of the things uh, that impacted uh, our maritime regulations in that. Some of the things are pretty obvious. You uh, would not think that a ship would sail without having enough lifeboat capacity for its people, but that's what happened in the Titanic. You had, uh, it was designed to carry 42 lifeboats, but at, at whatever uh, the designers or at the owner's option, they, they said, because the Titanic, if you will remember, was built as this unsinkable ship, latest of its design and, you know, so many passengers, luxurious, uh, beyond imagination for that time. So it could actually hold only 11, uh, whatever, 1,178 people when it had 2,228. So, I mean, basically there was a problem there. And, uh, and then again, launching these lifeboats were a problem. In, it's not that they were launched in heavy seas or anything. The vessel, as you all know, hit an iceberg, somebody, they were going in an iceberg uh, prone area. Uh, I think there was a, um, they, they were supposed to have, if you've seen the movie, they were supposed to have reduced speed because they were in the iceberg zone, iceberg area, uh, but they chose not to because they wanted to make it in that record time and come on, the Titanic was supposed to be unsinkable, so, you know, didn't need to bother about things like icebergs. Unfortunately, they, they, they came upon this iceberg too late and uh, what they did was they took a hard, uh, I think, maneuver to the starboard, I think, and, but the port side grazed against the side of the iceberg and there was a gash in the side that ripped through several compartments. So, uh, of course, the people talk about if they had rammed it head-on, possibly it might not have sunk. But who knows? So this is what led to the, uh, I think, 1911, 1911, the Titanic sank. I think it was 14th April. And in 1914, they had the, uh, sorry, 1912 was the thing. And 1914, they had the first convening of the SOLAS convention, where they looked into these basic things, which, which was uh, uh, wrong with the Titanic's design, and which they felt needed to be imposed on the rest of the shipping industry. So there were 13 countries that convened together and they formulated what became known as the SOLAS. So some of this was um, provision of watertight and, and firetight bulkheads. Um, not that the Titanic did not have bulkheads, but these bulkheads did not, surprisingly, again, you will find it uh, surprising that she did not, did not um, extend to the bulkhead deck, to the uppermost continuous uh, deck. So which is what happened in the Titanic was not that the compartments were not watertight, but they were not watertight up to the freeboard deck. So what happened was one compartment flooded and spilled over to the next and the next, and it wasn't long before the ship sank. So these things appear to us very, very obvious now, but they took time to evolve. And, and it's only when an accident like that happens, the focus of public attention 
comes on these things. And then it looks like these were obvious measures that we should have taken. The other thing was to do with the radio telegraph equipment. You know, the, it's not that ships did not have equipment, but there was nothing specified, nothing standard, no minimums specified. And of course, the thing of survival craft for all persons on board, that was definitely there, including life jackets, life boys, distress signals. Also in the establishment of a North Atlantic ice patrol, where ships report on the movement and uh, occurrence and frequency of iceberg in a certain area. The other thing that uh, it was not so obvious and did not probably uh, impact the, regulator, uh, the uh, statutory regulations, but which I think came into the class, people started looking at low temperature properties of steel. Because after a lot of investigation, uh, there was conjecture that possibly if that steel had been ductile at low temperatures, it might not have fractured. It might have got dented, it might have got damaged, but not fractured. So leading to uh, whatever, loss of watertight integrity for the vessel and its sinking. So, uh, what they found was that the uh, low toughness uh, was because of the low manganese to carbon ratio, large ferrite grain size, and other microstructure properties, which, uh, which had very low, which resulted in very low uh, temperature properties. I mean, now she was going in, what, ice water, so temperatures must have been very close to zero, you know. So, but the thing is that at that time, the steels which were being produced, they did not probably have the technology to produce steels with higher notch toughness. But uh, that, that, that came later, but this was one of the aspects which look, started looking into impact properties of steel, and we started specifying certain temperatures, so grade Bs and grade Ds and grade E steels started coming about as a result of this. Also, there was something about the rivets, um, um, where the slag stringers oriented perpendicular to the tensile axis um, may have been a direct contributor to the type and distribution of damage to the hull. This is, okay, you know, the, the way the rivets were formed or the type of steel that they uh, the basic ingots that they used, the rivets to, maybe the axis that they took it was wrong or something. This could have been one of the causes.